welcome to the topic of hemodynamics in this chapter we will see various uh, disorders that causes bleeding so the platelet disorders the hemophilias the various other coagulopathies including shock and dic disseminated intravascular coagulation overall this chapter appears uh, little complicated but once you understand the basic concepts it becomes very interesting and uh, uh, it becomes very easy for you to understand the concepts so let us have look first on the normal hemostasis how the blood is maintained at a fluid status whenever it is required it is able to form a clot blood clot so it's all because the blood is having both procoagulant activity and you know anticoagulant activity so it is the endothelial cells which will play important role in the normal hemostasis process so let us have a look how the normal hemostasis will takes place the normal component of the hemostasis it includes endothelial cells which are integral part of normal hemostasis the platelets various plasma coagulation factors not only the activating factors equal amount of inhibitory factors and the fibrinolytic system which will dissolve the that blood clot that is formed remember once there is a injury to the endothelial cells the first and foremost mechanism that will come to prevent excess amount of blood loss is the transient vasoconstriction it's all because of the neurohumeral reflex mechanism it will not last for very long time it is very short term so here you see a diagram where the endothelial cells are there here intact but whenever there is endothelial cells are ruptured this particular area of injury it exposes the subendothelial collagen remember subendothelial collagen high is highly thrombogenic that means it helps the formation of a thrombus it attracts more and more platelets so the first and foremost stage is the vasoconstriction which will mainly neurohumeral reflex mechanism are mediated and this particular area at the site of injury it attracts more and more platelets so formation of a platelet is so called as primary hemostasis it is all because that highly thrombogenic subendothelial collagen attracts more and more platelets platelets which are there in the circulating blood they will come and accumulate here at the site of injury so formation of a platelet plug is a component of a primary hemostasis here the tissue factor will activate the coagulation cascade and the thrombin will be formed once the platelets come and accumulate here at the site of injury they will not sit quiet they will change their shape they keep on secreting plenty of granules and what is the difference between primary hemostasis and secondary hemostasis in secondary hemostasis there is a formation of a fibrin you know the end product of coagulation cascade is the formation of a fibrin here in the secondary hemostasis there is a formation of a fibrin so this is something like a threads that will entangle the mesh of the platelets that are formed so now the stability is well defined so this is well stabilized platelet plug will be formed in the primary hemostasis the platelet plug is very loose they are loosely attached to each other and in the secondary hemostasis the fibrin is the like a thread like material that is the one which will bind firmly the platelet plug so that is a difference between primary hemostasis and the secondary hemostasis fibrin deposition takes place with the secondary hemostasis as the time advances there will be a so called as tertiary hemostasis will takes place what are all the granules in the platelets and what are the contents of platelet granules have a look of this chart platelet will have plenty of granules so called as alpha granules and delta granules alpha granules contains fibrinogen fibronectin factor 5 and factor 8 and transforming growth factor beta and even alpha whereas platelet delta granules contains adenosine diphosphate atps calcium ions and even histamine serotonin and epinephrine so so many things will be released once the platelets are get activated and they start keep on secreting the granules what will happen with the tertiary hemostasis the thrombus that is formed which is nothing but entangled mesh of a platelets along with that rbcs will be there and even the wbcs are get trapped in that particular uh, mesh so this is a thrombus that is formed so this particular thrombus will be removed later on by the fibrinolytic system so at this particular point can you tell is the endothelium is prothrombogenic or anti thrombogenic remember 
it is having both the characteristics a perfect balance will be maintained always between the prothrombotic activity and the antithrombotic activity that's how the blood is maintained at the fluid status so it is having both prothrombotic and antithrombotic properties a balance should be there and that is the one which will de determine the fate of a thrombus the endothelial cells are get activated by various factors like infectious agents various hemodynamic forces and even plasma mediators like cytokines remember the antithrombotics and prothrombotics that are secreted by endothelial cells so this is very commonly they will ask in the mcqs antithrombotics that are secreted by the endothelial cells are prostaglandin i2 nitric oxide adenosine diphosphate heparin like molecules tissue plasminogen activator thrombomodulin and protein c and s so these are antithrombotics whereas prothrombotics are van elebrand factor tissue factor and plasminogen activator inhibitors so remember there will be a perfect balance between the procoagulant activity and the anticoagulant factors in the normal hemostasis this is how it is maintained any imbalance between these two things can cause a thrombus formation and it can adversely affect the body remember in between the two subendothelial cells there is a subendothelial collagen it is nothing but the basement membrane which is made up of type 4 collagen once there is a endothelial cell injury that makes the endothelial cells to get exposed the blood to get exposed to the subendothelial collagen this is highly thrombogenic that means it attracts more and more platelets so more and more platelets will come and accumulate remember platelets will have plenty of surface molecules so called as glycoprotein 1b they also will have other molecules like a glycoprotein 2b 3a complex any deficiency of these molecules will cause variety of disorders the there is a factor so called as van der brand factor that act as a bridge between the platelets and the subendothelial collagen so what is the function of van der brand factor it is a bridge between the platelets and the subendothelial collagen so three disorders you can explain with this particular diagram that deficiency of van der brand factor causes a disorder so called as van der brand disease deficiency of glycoprotein 1b causes a disease so called as bernard soulier syndrome and deficiency of glycoprotein 2b 3a complex results in a disease so called as glanzmann thrombasthenia that is weakness in the attachment of the platelets so remember this particular diagram you can answer so many mcqs so is easy to remember that there is a van der brand factor which will act like a bridge between platelet and the subendothelial collagen this is highly thrombogenic material and once there is endothelial injury platelets will come and accumulate and form the platelet plug and this is how the primary hemostasis will take place two platelets are joined each other with the help of other molecules like a glycoprotein 1b and 2b 3a complex so weakness in adhesion, adhesion and attachment of platelets is so called as glanzmann's thrombasthenia is mainly due to the deficiency of glycoprotein 2b 3a complex so with that uh, brief introduction about the primary hemostasis normal hemostasis as such let us see the disturbances with the hemostasis what is an edema edema is increased fluid accumulation in the interstitial tissue spaces what are the causes for edema three causes either it could be due to the increased hydrostatic pressure reduced plasma oncotic pressure or it could be due to the lymphatic obstruction so anything that causes increased hydrostatic pressure or that decreases the plasma oncotic pressure or also called as plasma colloid pressure or that causes the lymphatic obstruction this any one of these three things can cause an edema so disturbance in any one of these can cause increased interstitial fluid accumulation and more and more fluid will escape from the intravascular compartment to the extravascular compartment and the fluid will accumulate in the extravascular compartment in the interstitial space resulting in the edema so what are the causes for increased hydrostatic pressure some of the common causes are impaired venous drainage due to patient having the congestive heart failure constrictive pericarditis patient having massive ascites and venous compressions either by tumors or by retroperitoneal fibrosis all those things can cause increased hydrostatic pressure the causes for reduced plasma oncotic pressure or osmotic pressure are mainly due to the hypoproteinemia the serum levels of albumin levels will be very very low 
in patient with the nephrotic syndrome where there is massive proteinuria more than 3.5 grams of proteins will be excreted out of body every day cirrhosis of liver where synthesis of albumin is get hampered malnutritional status like marasmus and quashiorkor pem status and so called as protein losing enteropathies can also result in the hypoproteinemia and they can result in the edema the third thing is the lymphatic obstruction that also causes and contributes for edema quite rare inflammatory causes like in patient with a failure access neoplastic conditions due to the metastatic deposits in the draining lymphatics post surgical say for example after a, a radical mastectomy patient will have a edema of the upper limb so it's mainly post surgical due to the disturbance in the lymphatic channels in the axilla or sometimes it could be due to the post radiation therapy which will induce the fibrosis and obstruct the lymphatic drainage so these are the important causes for the lymphatic obstruction resulting in the edema so any one of these can cause the edema formation so let us have a look at different types of edema remember periorbital edema is very very common in the patient with the kidney disorders severe renal disorders especially nephrotic syndrome they will have a periorbital edema why around the periorbital because around the orbit they say that the loose connective tissue will be there that favors the accumulation of the interstitial fluid pitting edema you have to put your pressure over the anterior tibia over the bony prominences you have to look for the appearance of your finger prints so that is pitting edema very commonly seen in patient with a congestive heart failure pulmonary edema which is seen with the left ventricular failure with the patient with a renal failure ard acute respiratory distress syndrome pulmonary infections hypersensitivity reactions all these things can cause pulmonary edema in a pulmonary edema if you take a lungs they will be very heavy once you cut open there will be a frothy and hemorrhagic fluid will ooze outside so grass itself you can make out that patient is having pulmonary edema and if you take a sections from that lung you will see that a lot of edematous fluid which will accumulate as eosinophilic homogeneous material in between the alveolar uh, spaces brain edema is more dangerous is can be due to the encephalitis sometimes due to the hypertensive crisis or also due to the obstruction to the cerebral venous outflow laryngeal edema also can occur due to the anaphylaxis so these are the different types of edema we will see the details about disturbances of the hemostasis in the next topic